right. Well, happy Father's Day, gentlemen. Thank you. Yeah, there, I was waiting for all the guys to catch on to that, but they're... All right. Thank you, Joshua. Okay, this is a new one for me. Um, usually I'm the uh, stand-in preacher for Mother's Day. I think I've done four out of the last six. But for today, I get to take a shot at the dads. And I'm afraid it's going to be a bit of a drive-by because my wife and I and Delia are heading out for a wedding. A former student of ours is getting married, and it's a four-and-a-half-hour drive, and it starts at five. So we're hoping there's no traffic and that we can actually make that, but we're going we're gonna to head out as soon as this is over. So if you can't find me afterwards, that's why. You know, a couple of years ago, I compared uh, mothers to Navy SEALs. And, you know, the Navy SEALs may be tough, but they've got nothing on you ladies. And I had a number of you guys waiting on your hoo moment, if you remember that. hoo we used it as a kind of an amen type response to something that, or anything that resonated during the sermon. Today I want to talk to the dads, and I want to talk about dad bods. You heard right, dad bods. For some reason, our culture has decided to celebrate the dad bod. You know what it is, the addition of a few pounds, spare tire, extra flotation, few gray hairs and wrinkles added in, and somehow we're celebrated. You ladies, I, you have to work super hard to, for this culture to decide to celebrate you. Us guys, we just have to get old and fat and we're good. All right. Um, I don't know how that happened, but the dad bod is apparently even being celebrated amongst Hollywood as the hot new look. Um, you've even got some celebrities have latched on to this more attainable physique um, with male actors sporting bodies that are not chiseled, not incredibly lean, and are even a little bit soft and squishy in the middle. In 2017, so just about four or five years ago, the first study, I don't know why we're doing studies on these things, but the first study on the bodies of men found that 69% of women find dad bods attractive. And apparently 64% of men who have a dad bod say they're confident and comfortable with their body. We have way too much time and money on our hands in this culture to be conducting studies on such things, but here we are. Surveys even suggest that men with dad bods have happier marriages. Who knew? But as much fun as talking about dad bods for 30 minutes sounds, I don't think any of us want that. Some of you are probably already trying to figure out how you can sneak out the back stealthily, get an early lunch. Well, settle down, cancel any thoughts you have of ducking out a side door, because we're not actually going to conduct any further studies on the subject or spend any time obsessing over our father figures. See what I did there? All right, thank you. Thank you for those of you who laughed. I appreciate that. But instead, we're going to allow Scripture to remind us of the vital roles that dads play in God's kingdom plans or kingdom agenda. And with this one, there's a slight military theme that we're adopting for this one as well. For some reason, I think I'm a little obsessed with the military. Maybe I missed my calling. But um, here's what I've got. So Dad Bods is actually an acronym for God's... Let's have the slide there, Joshua. God's Blessing Ordinance delivery system. And I didn't misspell ordinance. I had to check a few times, but I actually did not misspell ordinance there. A delivery system for weapons and ammunition is essentially the vehicle or the mode of delivery or what's used to send the payload or the ordinance to its destination for its desired impact. We have watched way too much of this in the news lately with Russia and Ukraine. Ordnance is a military term for ammunition and weapons, and it includes all sorts of ammunition, missiles, bombs, toxic chemicals, and even as much as nuclear weapons. Here's a definition of a bomb that I found just for, for fun. A bomb is a container carrying an explosive charge that is fused to detonate under certain conditions, usually upon impact, that is either dropped 
from an airplane or set in, into position at a given point. So it's a container that carries this payload of explosives that is set to detonate and have its impact at a certain point or place in time, either by setting it there or by dropping it. We have become way too good at this sort of thing. We've got cluster bombs. These are for the people who aren't very good with aiming because they just spread out and you hit everything within a mile radius, all right? You've got the smart bomb. Not to be confused with the smartphone, but apparently these smart bombs, they can kind of guide their way in. Um, they got little flaps and stuff that can move to adjust to the position that they specifically want to go. We've got guided missiles that have little GPS in there that they just hit their target within like meters, okay? We've got the hand tossed, not to be confused with the pizza, but like grenades, where you pull the pin, you throw it where you want it, boom. We've got bunker busters, where there's all, essentially two bombs in one. The first one busts open the hole, the second one goes straight in and destroys everything underneath it. And then if you've watched the news at all, you've seen that Russia have been using these bombs that are essentially outlawed. They're called vacuum bombs, or thermobaric, which are particularly nasty. All of these have incredibly destructive capabilities. And it seems as humans we are very adept at that. A blessing ordinance is the opposite. A blessing ordinance is ordinance that packs the potential to be constructive rather than destructive. Biblically speaking, blessing is far more than we've, what we've often kind of reduced it to. We throw this word blessing around very casually in the church and in our culture as a whole even. We talk about God, God bless America, which he has, and we often don't recognize it. Um, sometimes when I hear us believers talking about things that we see as being a blessing to us, I kind of cringe a little inside because we often simply mean that something good has happened to us. And it's very myopic in its scope and the way we look at it, we're thinking about how it has affected and impacted us. It's met our needs or our wants. And so it must be a blessing. And oftentimes, God doesn't really come into our thought process all that much. It's just that we're blessed and we're, we have blessings. We may equally be able to say sometimes in the church, I feel like sometimes the word blessing is just a code word for, I had a good week, I got lucky. I'm a lucky person. But blessing as defined by Scripture is much longer lasting and more far-reaching than we can even begin to give the word credit for. Those that Jesus called blessed especially in the Beatitudes, are those who took a stand against the lack of values that the culture and the world had. And they often faced hardship over the choices that they made, but Jesus called those people blessed. Why? Because there was a deeper level of, of blessing, of fortune coming their way to God that had nothing to do with the material world that we live in, oftentimes. The blessing was and is deeper than what appears on the surface, and it is largely spiritual in nature, and it's always centered on our long-term connection with Christ. It's harder to explain and to grasp, but for those of us who know God, it's more real than the temporary comforts of this world. It can come in the form of real, meeting real-world needs, absolutely. It can come in the form of financial or material meeting of needs, but it's far more than that and packs much more of a punch as far as its impact potential on the life or the lives of those affected. William Brown puts it this way. He says, the most recognizable references to blessing come from the teachings of Jesus. He declares that in spite of difficulties at the present time, the promises of God's salvation and coming kingdom bring a deep state of happiness, contentment, and recognize favor with God. The culmination of the scriptures proclaim the end of the curse and the eternal blessedness of the people of God. If military ordinance is de designed to destroy, then God's blessing ordinance is designed to repair, heal, rebuild, and refocus us to the eternal. 
talks about ending the curse. It's reversing the curse and the damage that was done in the Garden of Eden and that has ravaged our world ever since and ravaged us. It's about turning back the clock on those things. Interestingly enough, when I looked up antonyms, words that are opposite for the word destroy, guess what word or one word that popped in there that I was kind of surprised to see? The word father is actually listed as an antonym to the word destroy. To father is to create, to sustain, to build, and to construct. Now, you guys know as well as I do, we live in a world where that's not always the case. But that's what we're called to. And there's no doubt that when we read Scripture that dads are God's chosen and intended mode of ve or vehicle of delivering this kingdom impact or payload of blessing on the world both in how we raise and love our own kids, but also when we then unleash those kids as healthy, well-adjusted adults who love the Lord to the, on a world that, he, that Jesus loves and he died for. Dad bods are God's blessing ordinance delivery system to the world. This morning I want us to look at a couple of psalms. Um, I joked with my wife this week that I wanted to steer away from the psalms because I feel like I'm becoming a bit of a one-hit wonder. Um, in the sense that my last three sermons have been based on the Psalms. And so I thought, let me do something completely different. And then I ended up with two rather than one Psalm. So we're going to tackle two. So I'm still a one hit wonder. There, before you get worried, there are only 11 verses in these two Psalms. We're going to look at Psalm 127 and Psalm 128. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn. Or if you have your phones that you're using, just pull it up there. These, these Psalms are described as godly wisdom concerning hearth and home. Both psalms share the theme of domestic happiness, and so their placement together would appear to be deliberate. And both, as far as I can tell, seem to be largely addressed to dads in particular as their primary audi audience. So let's start by reading both, and then we will jump in and start breaking it down. So start at Psalm 127. It says, Unless the Lord builds the house... The builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat. For he grants sleep to those he loves, or rest to those he loves. Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. And then Psalm 128. It says, Blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in obedience to him. You will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Yes, this will be the blessing for the man who fears the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you live to see your children's children. Peace be on Israel. Psalm 127 essentially sets the stage for Psalm 128. So there are a couple of points I want to draw out from Psalm 127 before we get to Psalm 28, where I want to largely focus. Psalm 127 can largely or easily be split into two main sections, verses 1 through 2, and then verses 3 through 5. Both of them are aimed at men. Both psalms are aimed at us men. That's not to say that there's nothing of value in them for the ladies. All scripture is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, etc., etc. You know that? I said, but they are directed at men as heads of their household whose responsibility it is to engage and lead in their homes. So verse 1 through 2, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. These verses are essentially right off, the, right off the bat, right off the get-go, we are reminded that all of life's blessings and stability 
and security are gifts from God. They provide context. We can work all we want to provide these things for our families, but if we do it apart from God and in our own strength, we will ultimately fail. Stability and security are heart issues rather than material ones. If we want things in our home life and in the lives of our kids, or want these things in the lives of our kids and in our home life, we have to get first things first. We need to make the Lord the head of our household, the head of our life as we lead the household and keep him front and center. Without him, we're destined to fail. In fact, it's worse than that. The harder we work for these things on our own, the more likely it is to actually even backfire on us. The more we chase the things of this world for comfort and security, the more insecure our children are likely to be because they're watching us pursue the wrong thing. Where it says, in vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat. And it's not just food, it's they're toiling for success, toiling for wealth, toiling for moving up the corporate ladder, all of those things. He says, if, if that's what you're working towards, you're doing it in vain because your children are watching you and they will feel less secure with you just chasing all of those things. And we can call it providing for our family, but if, if we're doing it apart from God, we are... We are digging ourselves a hole and making trouble for ourselves and our kids down the road. It's a word of warning for us as fathers. And it's followed by a reminder in the next few verses of the precious value that our kids have, along with a peculiar kind of description. It starts off well enough. It says, children are a heritage from the Lord. They're, your offspring are a reward from him. Now, I assume I'm not alone in this. I hope I'm not alone in this, but we'll find out. But I know sometimes our children can feel more like an inconvenience or a burden. Sorry, Dee, where are you at? I'm not talking about you specifically, but you're here, so. Um, I remember when, when mine were younger, um, bedtimes used to really cut into my TV watching. We used to, well, Elisa used to read to them before we tucked them in at night and then prayed for them and then turned out the lights or argued with the girls as to which one was going to turn out the light first. Um, and it was always horribly inconvenient. This is at a time before DVR, before all streaming episodes where you can watch them at your own convenience. And so I would, it, it never failed. I would be in the middle of a show and Elisa was like, I'm done reading. Can you come and pray with the kids? I'm like, but something exciting is about to happen. I'm just about to find out who did it. I'm about to find out what happens next. The, the big, cli the excitement, the climax of the show has come. And I, yeah, and I'm being like, uh, can you just pray for them while I keep watching? And it was, it was inconvenient. And I'll be honest with you, I, my heart struggled with it. Because I knew that the TV show I was watching by comparison to the life of my kids meant nothing. But the TV show held an allure for me. It was important to me, to the point where there were times I begrudgingly dragged myself off the couch and went into the room to pray with the kids or to help read to one of them or whatever it was. Um, and it's not that I didn't love my kids. I just didn't want to love them at that particular time. I was loving my TV show. And that's just one example. You guys know we've got plenty of examples like that. Your, your kids will challenge your selfishness it, they will expose how self-absorbed we are. Um, I used to, I had a friend of mine that I used to tell one time, I said that, he asked me how the uh, first rocky hard year of marriage was, because that's generally speaking the consensus that it's going to be, it's all this change, learning to live with someone, all of that. I said, you know, it's really not been that bad. It's everything that being a Christian since I was the age of six has prepared me for. You know, I've heard my whole life that I need to be a servant, that I need to love people, I need to forgive just as Christ forgave, and I've tried to do all of those things, and so to some degree now I'm living with this woman, and I've got all these things to do, but it, I've been doing them my whole life, or at least trying to figure out how to do them my whole life, and so this isn't that difficult. Now, I've since learned it's just that my wife was extremely gracious and made it easy for me, um, by generally speaking, not holding anything against me and stuff like that. So oftentimes I didn't have a whole lot or anything really to forgive her for. She was the one doing all the forgiving. 
Um, I thought I was just doing well as a Christian, Christian man. I'm like, I've got this marriage thing licked. I must, be, I must have done well as a Christian this, for this to be this comfortable. Well, then the kids come along, and they're not nearly as gracious or understanding of my selfishness and my focus on me and my need to do things the way I want to do them, and it exposed a lot of the flaws that I had all along. And initially, I didn't like it very much, and I took it out on them. I would get frustrated with them rather than frustrated with myself. Rather than embracing it as an opportunity to allow Christ to change me, I was determined to stay where I was, and they were just the inconvenience that were getting in the way and exposing this stuff. But children truly are a heritage from the Lord and a reward. If our goal as believers is to grow in Christ, then our children will, will and can help us do that by challenging us every step along the way to be less selfish and more outward focused and more loving and gracious and forgiving towards them. It helps us as, as men to grow in Christ. The next few verses are fascinating. As these next few verses I've, I mentioned in the parenting class are one of my dad's favorite, favorite verses or set of verses that he used to love to quote. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one, one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver, the little thing that he holds on his shoulder that holds them all, is full of them. Because if it's empty and you're at battle, it's a problem. You've seen Hawkeye, the show, any of you? Some of you guys are like, what? One of these Marvel characters, and he shoots arrows, and he's got all sorts of arrows. He's got ones that like have timer bombs on them, and some are just straight arrows. Some of them like blow up with uh, kind of gooey stuff. Some of them are like just bubbles, and I guess all sorts of stuff, and he picks the right arrow for the right occasion. Um, and the, the, some of my favorite scenes are when he's in this middle of this crazy battle, and he reaches back there, and there's nothing, and he's like, and then he kind of smiles at whoever is about to attack him at the time and improvises. But as a, an archer, you want your quiver to be full of arrows. You want them at your disposal to be able to use when you need them. And this is what this passage talks about our kids as. Your kids are like arrows in the hands of a warrior. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them and they will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. It's a beautiful illustration. But it's also a challenge, because it means as men, we're supposed to be in battle. And our children are something that we are supposed to invest in, build into, teach, train, mold, so they're effective when we need to use them. We are going to send these children into, into a lost and dying world that needs Christ as the payload, essentially, to impact a lost, lost world and a lost generation for Christ. So the time that we put in on the short amount of time that we have them, investing in them spiritually, teaching them the word, training them, molding them, disciplining and loving them, giving them the security and the foundation that they need to go into that lost world with comfort, with, with joy and with the strength of Christ, with a relationship with Christ that will enable them to make an impact and make a difference. That time that we have is vital that we are focused and that we are doing the things that we need to do. And this leads straight into many ways into Psalm 128. Essentially what this is talking about is that our kids are ordnance. Our kids are the weapons and the ammunition that the Lord wants to use to reach a world that he loves. In Psalm 128 then gives us a clear idea of how this is supposed to work. Psalm 128 is six verses broken down into four main areas or spheres in which God works to achieve his purposes through us men. Four areas of life that require engagement from us. God's kingdom agenda is described as bringing everything under the comprehensive rule of God. 
and his chosen vehicle to achieve this? Us, men, dads. We are his delivery system for the love that he wants to unleash on the world. And again, I believe this passage is specifically addressed to us. It's the perfect Father's Day psalm. We are called to be the drivers of God's agenda. We're not called to be passengers or just passive. We're called to help drive this agenda that God has for the world, starting at home and spreading out from there. The four areas or spheres through which God operates are as follows. Sphere number one is the individual, the man. Okay. Sphere number two is the family. Sphere number three is the church, and that's actually us. And sphere number four is society as a whole or our community and then extending through to our country. So sphere number one, if you look at verses one and two in Psalm 128, it says, blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in obedience to him. You will eat the fruit of your labor, blessings and prosperity will be yours. The first step in this process of bringing all things under the comprehensive rule of God starts with you. Without this aspect, the rest does not happen. Start with the man in the mirror. Take a long, hard look at the dad bod inside. What state is your delivery system in? Are you living under the rule of God? Or are you doing your own thing? Have you submitted all of yourself all aspects of your life to his divine guidance and control? Is it an ongoing process with you or has at some point, has it stalled? I think this stalling happens with a lot of men. Different cycles of life, different things happen. Um, we get disillusioned with things. Um, we fail, we mess up, we sin, whatever it is, things happen and we check out. We, we feel like a failure or we feel like we haven't, we're not equipped enough or we're, we haven't got enough courage or whatever to fill in the blanks and we just kind of stall in our walk with God. We stall in our commitment to our families and we just kind of bottom out. But he says, blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in obedience with him. It's never too late to get back on track. God is not interested in us just being or just being a Sunday morning God to us. He wants to be intimately involved in every aspect of our day to day. It's a relationship. He wants to know you. He wants to love you. He wants to guide you. He wants to walk you through this process. Why? Because he wants to work through you to impact a world that needs him. For some reason, he has chosen to use us. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the world has made it hard for us to lead. I don't think it's a coincidence that so many men are passive rather than aggressively leading in the kingdom of God. I don't think that's a coincidence at all. I think that's exactly what Satan wants because this is God's chosen mode of delivery. And God, Satan's like, if I can stop the delivery, I'm good. I stop future impact. There's a promise that comes with this verse one about those who fear the Lord, who walk in obedience with him, they're blessed. He says, you will eat the fruit of your labors. Blessing and prosperity will be yours. Some translations have this as, you will be happy and it will go well with you. Essentially, the Lord promises that if we walk with him and we keep ourselves on track, he will oversee our fortunes our feelings, and our futures. It transitions very, very easily into the next sphere of influence, the next area that God wants to work through us men, and that's in our families. It doesn't take a genius to notice that a fa the family has been under attack in the U.S. and the world for decades now, probably even longer than that, probably since the beginning of time. Because the, va the family, God created it to be the foundation of civilizations. It's created to be the vehicle through which God's love goes to our children, which goes out to the world. The family should be the launch pad 
for healthy, godly kids to influence a lost and hurting world. He designed us men to be the godly leaders in our homes. And so in these verses, he addresses us directly. He says, to the man who fears the Lord in verse 4, and then he goes back to verse 3. You can read it that way. He says, your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Men, as you walk with the Lord, as you have your, your self right before him, your wife automatically benefits. As you engage with your kids and you engage in the household and stop just checking out, which I'm as guilty of this as the rest of, as the rest of us, it's easy as a man to come home from work and be, man, I'm tired. Hit the couch, pull up the remote, and just check out. My wife often accuses me of not paying attention to conversations that the rest of the family are having. She's like, we just talked about this. I'm like, when did we talk about this? I don't remember that. She said, well, you, you were watching your TV show or you were doing something else, looking at your phone while we were all having that conversation. I said, well, was I supposed to be a part of the conversation? She said, we talked about it right in front of you. I'm like, no one mentioned my name. So I just, and I've, I've got a really good, I've become really good at selective hearing. I think that's a man skill right there. Um, what's the joke that my wife says that I've got two main flaws? not listening well and something else. <laughs> but when, when we are engaged in the family, when we are working in unison in partnership with our wives to raise these children to be godly kids, when we are engaged in the spiritual wealth or benefit of our family, it says our wives will benefit. They will be like a fruitful vine. Because our wives are like a fruitful vine, our kids automatically benefit from that. He says, your children will be like olive shoots around your table. When a husband takes seriously and takes God seriously and becomes the servant leader in his home, loving his wife selfless, selflessly and sacrificially as Christ loved the church, which is how what we're charged to in Ephesians 15. It's a tall order, guys. But when we do that, our wives blossom. She sees that we're willing to work as hard and intentionally at our role as dad as we are at our job. Sometimes I think we get caught up being provider that we forget that our wife and kids need us to be present emotionally too and spiritually. She doesn't feel like she is carrying the burden of raising the kids alone while we just sit around watching TV, hanging out with friends, or just generally checking out. And as I've said before, I'm guilty of all three. I used to joke around that one day I was going to write a tongue-in-cheek book called 101 Ways to Parent from the Couch. Except if I'm really honest with you, I'm not sure at the time that I was joking about this that there would have been too much tongue-in-cheek about it. At times I was trying to parent from the couch. It doesn't really work very well. Honey, the kids need you. Next, turn the volume up, whatever. His children will be like olive shoots around his table, sprouting with potential and possibilities of what's to come. Why around the table? Eating together, sharing together. A father utilizing the opportunities for undivided attention to teach and mold his kids with godly wisdom based upon study of God's word and his experience walking with him. The pairing of the vine and the olive in these verses is pretty common in the Old Testament. They were both plants that lived long lives and produced the wine and olive oil that was central to the prosperity and the economic benefit of the household and the community. The imagery is designed to elicit ideas of a happy, fruitful, joyful home life. And from there, we very naturally move on to the th third sphere, the third area through which God works and wants to, wants to use men. And that's the church. In verse 5, it says, May the Lord bless you from Zion. Zion was often used in the Old Testament to describe either the city of Jerusalem or the temple within it. In many ways, for, for Jews at the time, they were kind of synonymous. In the New Testament, the church is considered the temple of God. In Hebrews 12, 22, Christians are said to come worship at Mount Zion. So for us as believers, Zion refers to the church, to God's people, to the family of God. And this is why family is so important. The church is just an extension 
of a believer's family. We are called to be part of God's covenant community. Sometimes I wonder, as a pastor, if lack of involvement in God's family is an indicator of the same thing going on at home. COVID seems to have given us the impression that we can make church attendance and engagement an optional extra. But God's calling for us has not changed just because of COVID. If you've professed faith in Jesus Christ, you're not, only, you're not an only child, but you're part of a family of believers that, God called, that, that calls God our Father. Now more than ever, we are called to take an active and engaged role in His church, in the local body. It's a normal and still expected part of the Christian experience. Just like your family needs you to come out of your room or come out of your bubble, the family of God needs you to engage. Men, the church needs you to lead your families, but your, the church also needs you to lead God's family. We need more of you to step up and teach. We need more of you to join in Awana leadership. These kids need a male father figure they need male role models to see what a man walking with christ looks like the students down below i had i had a guy text me this morning saying happy father's day he says you've been more of a father to me than my own has we need father figures down in the student ministry we've got kids coming that aren't connected with our body. We've got kids coming from other churches. We've got kids coming from the community who need people to love on them and love them into the kingdom and show what a true father looks like. As I mentioned earlier, for some reason, the world we live in has made male leadership and engagement in the church, for some reason, a difficult prospect for us. It's like none of us feel equipped or ready, and I'll admit to that too. I've been doing it for 20-something years, and there's times I still don't feel like I've got all the answers that I need, and I have all the training that I need, and I'm equipped enough. But I've learned over the years that that's not the point. In many ways, that puts me in the best position possible to be used by God, because I'm dependent upon Him to work through me. If I feel like I've ever got it all figured out, then I probably am disqualifying myself from ministry because at that point I've decided I don't need God to do His work. And that's never the case. The fact that we feel ill-equipped is probably a good thing because it puts us in dependence on Him. Now, our role as pastors within the church is to equip you for works and service. But some of that comes simply from experience. I love that we've got all of these adult equipping classes right now. We've got all these guys stepping up to teach things that haven't done so normally. And it's great to see you guys learning the process. And some of you guys are probably better at it than I am, and I've been doing it a while. Um, but that's great. I love that. That's what the Church of Christ should look like. Men and women stepping up to be used by God in areas that they don't feel enormously comfortable in. Out of their comfort zone, trusting God to work through us. And in the process, we grow. Tony Evans said this about the church and its place in our lives. He said, the church is where the rules of eternity operate at a specific location in history. The church is where the rules of eternity operate at a location in history. He says, we gather together to hear from heaven so that we, we may then live out heaven's viewpoint in the world and to the world. Disengagement as men leads to unexploded ordinance later. A vital part of raising our kids is teaching them how to walk with God and how to trust God so that they can be used by Him later in the way that He designed them for, to bring people to Him. People that they're going to meet in college, kids they're going to run into at high school in the neighborhood, and later on when they have families of their own, that they are equipped and they are ready to have the desired impact that God wants them to have. 
The last area is society or our community and our country. We've got both our community and our country represented here by the flags. He says, May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you live to see your children's children. Peace be on Israel. The psalmist concludes with a desire to see prosperity in both Jerusalem and peace in Israel. The mention of seeing his children's children is not accidental there. Because guess who is expected to have contributed to this peace and prosperity? His own children. Passing along what he has taught them, what he has modeled for them, what, how he has loved them. Passing that on to their own children. And then on from there. And then reaching out into the world that we live we tend to expect our own country and lives to be made better from the top down. We live in a culture that's obsessed with politics. And we expect our leaders to do things that are going to have a good or a better impact on us. Even if we've given up, some of you may scoff at that. Um, but even the scoffing is because at one point in time we used to expect that. But we've been looking at the wrong house. It doesn't start at the White House. It starts in our own homes. God desires to see our society transformed all right, but not from the top down, but from the bottom up. When God's kingdom agenda is a genuine priority in individual men who are committed to raising families God's way, that are committed to churches, that are committed to making a difference in their communities, then society will be transformed to the be for the better and people will be introduced to our Savior Jesus Christ. And it all starts with dad bods. God's blessing ordinance delivery system. What shape is yours in? Let's pray. Lord, I'll admit that at times I shirk that responsibility um, I'm uncomfortable with it I feel ill-equipped for it but I think it says something about your trust in me and in us as men that you have bestowed that responsibility on us and that privilege on us thank you for the children that you've given us um, the opportunity to to love and to guide Lord I pray that you would help us to to do it to the best of our ability, that we would be 100% committed to growing in relationship with you and to leading them and to being engaged in our church so that we can impact the community around us for your kingdom. In your name.